Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Calgary and my home where I am right now is situated on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. And this includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Pikani and Kaina First Nations, as well as the Tsutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, which is the Chiniki, Bearspaw and Good Stony First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Districts 5 and 6. I just recently was at an Indigenous Reconciliation Center session and we talked a lot about land acknowledgements and there are just some strong views on them on all around. Um, but what was agreed was that they're really an important transition piece for us as we move toward reconciliation. Um, I, you know, I sometimes struggle with sharing them in such a way that like I feel truly sincere about it. Um, so I've been trying to figure out like maybe something I can do that is going to share, you know, a little bit about sort of my own journey. And I wanted to recommend a book that I've started reading. It's called The True Spirit and Original Intent of Treaty 7. And it's written by Treaty 7 elders or on behalf of its, its transcribed tra transcriptions of some um, words from different Treaty 7 elders. And it's, it's a really interesting read so far. So I recommend that uh, as a, as a place. It was recommended to me by, um, David Lertzman, who was a professor, a very beloved professor at the Haskane School of Business. So this is our monthly opportunity for members of the ecosystem to come. Uh, as, as we were just discussing, this is a watering hole where we can ask questions of the of the of our panel. It's held on the second Wednesday of every month from 3:30 to 5. These sessions are designed with you to be the driver of the discussion. And I'm going to really be putting you in the hot seat today because we don't have, we only had one question and the person who asked that question is not here. So hot seat. All right. So Jane, welcome. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I know um, I recognize a few faces from a, a few different uh, calls and some new faces. So I will bore some of the um, familiar faces, I'm sorry, with uh, our mission. So I work for a couple organizations, one of which is called Cycling Without Age, which is a nonprofit organization that's represented in about 43 countries. We go into care homes. We take seniors for bike rides in a specially designed bike we call a tri-shaw, which if you picture a rickshaw with the bench seat at the back that we're a lot a lot of us are familiar with it's actually at the front so um you know it's all about the seniors it's about really forming you know connections that happen a mutual connection so our volunteers are excited to see our seniors our seniors are excited to see our our volunteers and really get out and integrate in the community the other hat that i wear is with my partner mike foster who's on this call and we actually produce a what we consider high quality, more affordable trisha than what the program was originally started on and where the bikes come from other um, other countries. And so we've been able to produce a quality bike at at least half, if not more than half of some of the other um, groups out there. So in our hearts, it's about getting the seniors out there we um, we have built into our business plan that we will pay ourselves for the work we do, but it's a it is not a for profit arm of the organization. The other half of that organization, so it's called Cycles Tucson, is the um, bike company, is a for profit business. So if you think of the different models of bikes we have, some are for profit, and then ours is a social venture, which is a you know not we're not. Um, looking to make a profit off of our tri shots because we've been able to reduce the shipping costs we've been able to reduce the purchase costs we have sold probably almost across Canada with all of the cycling without aid chapters that have come on board we're probably sitting somewhere about 75 percent of them are our bikes and about 25 percent are still coming from um, other countries so um so as we're looking at applying for some grants, I guess our big question is, because we have the combination of products for profit and not for profit, 
just wondering, you know, um, would we qualify for most of the grants that are out there for the social ventures is our first question. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. It's really going to be specific on the grant. So mm -hmm. our grants, because we're a private foundation, given yeah. three, we do stay away from the for-profit side of things. So there'd have to be a pretty distinct legal mm -hmm. being the for-profit part of your enterprise as well as the not-for-profit. And even there, just being a not-for-profit, right now there is, as I'm sure you know, and I think we've talked about before, mm -hmm. transition with the federal yeah. government where uh, mm -hmm. foundations can now fund to non-qualified donees. But the, the, the system is kind of catching up to the legal change. So we're looking mm -hmm. into it, but it's going to take quite a while for us to actually be uh, yep. authorized by CRA to provide mm -hmm. grants to not qualified donees. But you're, yeah. it's going to be really specific. You're going to have to look at almost each grant that you want to do. I'm finding typically the government grants are the ones that are most liberal in terms, no, no pun mm -hmm. intended, most liberal in terms of being able to grant both to the for-profit and not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was kind of hoping Jane was on the call too, because I know her fund, like even if it's a loan, right? Like a, you know, a, a reasonable loan. Um, wondering if we still fall in that category. I don't want to speak for Jane, but my yeah. when she's talked about the program, is they're agnostic as to your legal structure. So right. that in and of itself yeah. wouldn't be a barrier. Yeah, yeah. From, from a loan standpoint, the Social Enterprise Fund, Jane uses that language all the time. That's why it's safe for Dan to say it, that they're mm -hmm. organizationally agnostic. So your organizational structure won't matter when it comes to okay. this fund and, and a loan. Mm -hmm. uh, and as Dan said, from a grant standpoint, it really does depend on the funder. And, and yeah. Dan's great that like a place like Prairies Can, formerly Western Economic Diversification, they grant all the time to businesses. Mm -hmm part of how they do business. It's not easy to get a grant from them. It takes yeah. a little time. So don't plan on it being quick, um, mm -hmm. but they're open to it. And then they right. also grant to not-for-profits. So they they don't, it doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really does depend on the funding source. Okay, thank you. Um, second question is, um, and I won't hog all the time, I promise. I only have two, um, is that, Given that our organization is making, like our our contribution to the cause is that we're making the purchase of the asset to be much more affordable, um, but we're not actually delivering the impact ourselves. It's the second party, right? It's the care homes that are purchasing our bikes or the community groups that are purchasing our bikes that are actually doing you know having the true impact and so I guess you know I I you know <laughs> I want to be authentic <laughs> but having that second kind of you know where the the impact is really measured is at that you know arm's distance right does that you know would that still again put us in that right category because we're doing the right thing for the right people we're just maybe the impact is you know the impact is been substantial across Canada as far as like one bike equals 200 people we do you know over 5,000 rides you know like it's easy to say here are the numbers here's the impact but it's not us delivering the service it's us delivering the bike and somebody else is delivering the service so just some thoughts about does that kind of get does that still keep us in the circle I guess I'm so, uh, I'm arriving late Jane but I just wonder um, how difficult is it for your beneficiary organizations to apply for funds to purchase? Because I think with the statistics that you're talking about, they could make mm -hmm. a case for them and, to and apply. They, yeah. And they are for the purchase of their bikes. But what Mike and I are doing is, I mean, it's, it's, I'll be completely transparent. I mean, it's coming out of my bank account. So we order 50 at a time. And um, right now we're seeing substantial growth. So instead of ordering 50 and being safe with 50 and, you know, being able to pay ourselves back and then do it again the next year. And, you know, we just want to be able to scale. Right. Because so, for example, we've launched between 15 to 20 each year um, for the last four years across Canada. Um, as far as new groups, we've done a lot of, you know, more bikes to existing groups. But um, in 
so far, and we're not even through March, we've already launched 14 new chapters. So we're seeing substantial uptake this year. And we just want to be, we want to make sure that anybody that wants this equipment can get the equipment, right? And so we're like, okay, this is a little bit more than we want to pull out of our own pocket. But yet we have a solid business model over the last four years where we can show, you know, um, we can show all our financials, we can show how quickly we can turn around our products, that kind of stuff. So so we're just looking at, you know, because I'm on this call for other reasons, <laughs> I was like, hey, wait a minute. I, I should start looking at our, you know, the other arm that I'm involved with, which is the um, bike production side. So. What does your banker think about front ending these costs and then giving you a year or two to to um, to pay? For we haven't gone time? there. You know, I mm-hmm. haven't gone there first, only because I figured interest rates were better with some of the. um some of the funding for social ventures out there right now. Yeah. And I then I'm yeah. curious about some of the so I would I would I'm always asking who cares about what we care about. And mm-hmm. so what about somebody sort of larger like Heart and Stroke or something approaching them to see if they'd been be interested in sponsoring, you know, mm-hmm. a, a sort of a bulk order which then they mm-hmm. could uh, maybe take charge yeah. of disbursement. So just curious. Yeah, it, it's a great idea. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's something to explore. Thank you. And, and Jane, can I just maybe clarify? Are you are you wondering if if like if you're impact enough to to sort of qualify for some of the? Yeah, absolutely, the Brad. Yeah, that's right? my question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, for, for us for, at UC, you know, we're, we we often think about you know how how a venture might be reducing barriers to access, and I think. Right. That that seems like that's what's happening here. Uh, there's, yeah. there's an intentionality behind what you're doing to mm-hmm. you know, to to enable access to you know outdoors and recreation for individuals mm-hmm. who typically have barriers. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I don't think there's anything disingenuous with claiming those impact mm-hmm. numbers uh, as long right. as you're qualifying sort of how they're being delivered. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't I don't think there'd be very many funders that would. Mm-hmm. Log it. At what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And just to clarify that the our customers, this is not a, a transactional business for them. It's all volunteers enab- enabling the program in their community. I think just building on Brad's points, and I agree. To me, the fact that you're reducing costs obviously empowers those other organizations that can be on a shoestring and volunteer based to enhance their impact. So as, as long as you're upfront about the, you know, here's the direct delivery organizations, but we're empowering them by making the product more affordable, right? To me, there that's a bridge that makes sense. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar, Jane, that I don't think there's any, it's just an indirect impact, but as long as you have a clear line of sight to that impact through your third party, there shouldn't be any hesitation for uh, a funder to support it, whether it's a grant or through the loans. And as Dan said, like one of those more direct line of sights is the cost savings. So for what it's worth, it's similar that we have grant money from different sources. This is not really a social enterprise aspect of momentum, but we train other uh-huh community-based organizations to use our published financial literacy curriculum. So they right. can do their own money management workshops out in the community. And they pay the, all the organizations that participate in that training and get the license, they pay a fairly small fee. We try to really keep the cost down. That's why we need outside grant money because otherwise it would be potentially too expensive for other community organizations to pay to do our financial literacy training and then receive some ongoing support for delivering that content. So when we make the grant application, it's that we're building capacity of other community organizations, other not for profits to deliver that content. And you know, it's it's we've never gotten pushed back on uh, on that indirect impact. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Well, thanks, Jane. And I love how Alberta you are right now. You are on a ski hill. That is amazing. So Three cheers for you. And you got me so excited because you put your hand up so quickly and because you were on a ski hill that I forgot to introduce our panel. So I'm sorry. 
<laughs> no, it's not your fault. I was like, yay, someone has a question. This I am playing beautiful. hooky today, but I still love you guys so much. I had to join. <laughs> I, I think it's amazing. There you are on the on the ski hill. It's wonderful. So before we carry on, we have a wonderful pet with us. We have um, Dan Overall here. Um, uh, we from Trico Foundation. We have Alex Laidlaw here from Calgary foundation jeff loomis is joining us with momentum and brad andrews is here from is it do i say social innovation hub for you brad yeah innovate calgary social innovation innovate hub. calgary okay all right so so welcome to you all my apologies for not introducing you right away i got so excited by the ski hill um all no, right uh, yeah can i just sorry quickly jump in just to build one final point for jane yes please uh Tan Tree, I think we've talked about it in previous sessions. They sell a t-shirt and for every t-shirt they plant 10 trees. So obviously that's an example that's kind of similar to yours where there's the financial connection and someone else is doing the direct on the ground impact. People would ask them, well, how do I know there's 10 trees being planted and what's the impact? So they actually turn that into a strength where they enhance their accountability where you can, they have like an app where you can actually get reports on where the trees planting were and stuff like that. So you could actually, and I'm not saying you have to do this, right. I'm just leaving as a possibility. You can actually turn that into a strength where you provide the information mm -hmm. reporting as to these other organizations and the impact they're having so that people who are then supporting you have more information about that impact than they otherwise would, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I you know, shoemaker's kid, right? I take care of everybody else, but not ourselves. Um, we haven't done any, yeah, we ha we certainly have those numbers, but haven't used them for anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, Leah. Thanks. That is a great idea. I love that. All right. Well, um, does anyone else have a question that they'd like or something they would like to discuss. It doesn't have to be a question. It can just be something you would like to discuss as well. Leah, can I ask a couple things? Just building oh, on what Jane do, was Mike. asking. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, Mike partnering with Jane on the uh, yeah, trishaws. Um, does it matter for an Alberta program if the social benefit is actually across Canada? So we, while we have clients that are buying our bike or customers are buying the bike and tri shells operating in Alberta, many of them in Calgary, in fact, uh, you know, we get orders from all across Canada. So we're happy to have our bikes basically from BC all the way into New Brunswick, for example. So is that a limitation or a problem? I'm jumping on this one because this is a question I often have to answer. Um, so I run a loan program at Calgary Foundation that's very similar to what Jane does at Social Enterprise Fund. Uh, and I think the answer here is dependent again on the, It's I hate the it depends answer, but it's an it depends on who you're working with, who's funding and who's potentially financing the work. Uh, for us, our current scope is even a little bit more limited than Jane's. Jane is Alberta wide. We're working specifically in Calgary and surrounding area geography. Uh, so we look for impact within that scope, but that will be different from a funder to funder basis in terms of what their mandate is, what they're looking to fund and how they're looking to have an impact in the community. So um, an unsatisfying answer in that it, it really does depend on who you're looking to work with as to what their goals are and how that connects to their investment priorities or their granting priorities. Yeah, yeah. maybe maybe to, <clears throat> to build on that a bit, Alex. So um so mike I, I also work with uc social impact fund um one of our one of our mandates is to to be um you know supporting social ventures that are having impact to albertans um when we see an opportunity that that we we think could have good impact for Al for alberta but they could have just kind of general good deep impact for society at large there are, and, and I, I know I've talked to a few other funders that are in a similar boat, you know, they can kind of squint at the details and, and make it fit in terms of those kind of hard and fast geographical requirements or, or any of these kind of general checkbox issues when like the business is, is solid and the impact is solid, I would say, um, is, is 
a perspective to to consider. So um, for sure, there are some that are going to have some hard and fast rules. But um, if you have some in Alberta and you're looking at some, you know, an Alberta based program, likely you're going to you're not going to get turned away. Um, OK, good to know and and uh, for us to be aware of. Um, in a, in the in a loan scenario, do do are there typical rules or any guides around the percentage that the group has to front versus the loan? You know, I'm thinking of a mortgage, for example, where you tend tend to have to have five or twenty or whatever the number is. Um, do in this case, you know, if we had a an order, and would we need to front fifty percent of it, or would we, you know, like I guess, are there any typical loan rules? And again, we've proven that this works, uh, the model works and we've got revenue from the last four years. So um, that that makes us comfortable with this, but uh, as Jane mentioned, we'd like to scale a little bit further. So just kind of curious if anybody has any comments about loan ratios perhaps. Great question. I can answer from our perspective in that one of the ways we like to be able to provide additional flexibility is not really having hard and fast rules in that we understand we want to get into the into the specific context so if you have great proof of concept from your history and you have these orders coming in and you have a certain amount we'd look at all of that there might be enough that we'd be happy with providing all the money you need and no upfront contribution like it it, it really is um something where it it can be quite fluid and flexible. Um, so at least from Calgary Foundation with our loan program, there is no hard and fast rule as to how much you might need to be putting in. Uh, we just would want to understand the nuts and bolts of what what's there and then what risk is involved. Great. Jeff, you shared a link in, in the chat there. Yeah, Mike, I put the YYC. So they're just an example of an investment fund that they want the businesses to be local. So like owned and operating to at least some degree in Calgary because it's a Calgary based fund. But lots of the businesses sell the products all over the place. So they're not limited to just where it's uh, owned and only operating in Calgary <clears throat> and the Calgary market. And then uh, as Alex said, like Social Enterprise Fund has the Alberta uh, owned and operating, but again, not exclusively limited to operating in Alberta. And Social Enterprise Fund, I've heard Jane say um, in these calls and other environments where she'll say like the track record of sales, is like a, a huge part, similar to what Alex said, that there isn't a set ratio. Uh, it's more dependent on that business and then, then the risk factor for the lender. And so the track record of sales is a significant one. So it sounds like you have a pretty good case because of being operating for a while and you're looking for scale up capital, which is uh, reasonable. Okay, thank you very much guys. That's very helpful. And thank you for the link. I've um, got that open here already. So <laughs> and I, just to jump in, this isn't me suggesting this. It's me mentioning it for you to consider. Now there's a legal nicety for someone to place through. Have you thought about maybe getting a, a line of credit? It sounds like, because if you're going from transaction to transaction where you kind of need to have that excess money and it's like a repeated kind of thing, like almost like a cash flow issue, you may want to explore the option of a line of credit. And I've lost track of the Fed's uh, initiatives like BDC and there used to be like Export Development Canada and things like that, whether they are open to these rotating lines of credit, that might be something for you to look into if you haven't. Yeah, I think we have a lot of um, different options in front of us. We just saw this as an opportunity to talk specifically around this, this area of social venture, knowing that there is, you know, a, a strong push in Alberta right now to be different, right? And for sure. Who doesn't want to be part of that train? Exactly. Great. Mike, did you have any other? No, I think that's very helpful. It, it gives us a few more clues on uh, the path forward and 
but, you know, honestly, we've, like Jane mentioned, we just, we've been doing this out of our own pocket and, and wanted to prove the model, which I, you know, that, that's got to say something, right? <laughs> when you can do it out of your own pocket, but uh, we want to, we, we'd like to move it forward even further. So, oh, and AB, Women's Enterprise. Okay, we'll look that one up as well. Thanks, uh, Debbie, I think it is. Yeah, Debbie, anything else you want to share about that? Sure, just that they've, um, if the uh, business is 51% owned by a woman, then, and 49% by other people, then you have access to, I believe it's up to $150,000 in loan opportunities. So you can check that one out. Great, thank you. I want to talk a little bit about the Alberta crowdfunding program too. So I, I work for the Alberta government. I'm a community development officer with their unit and been interested in social enterprise for a gazillion years. And um, for a while we were getting involved and then we weren't getting involved. <laughs> I'm never sure where we're, we're, we're really at, but we're talking about it again. So, um, so I'm always interested to see where that goes, but I do it mostly from the nonprofit sector point of view, not necessarily from private business. Uh, or uh, individual social entrepreneurs. But having said that, um, the other thing around, you're talking about a nonprofit aspect to, to your business as well. So we have the crowdfunding program. It's a new platform that was just done through the Alberta government. It's been up for about a year, I guess, roughly. So you can put a project on there and um, have, you know, initiate or organize or get your social media going and um, have donations made to your project. And if you get, I think, 75% of what you said you were going to raise, the government will top up the rest. So uh, it's not a grant program. It's not an application process. There's no uh, forms to fill out or any of that. You just have to put it up on the platform. So um, you could check that out. Um, I liked the the lady said that and I was going to say it, but I'm glad she did about having the other organizations that are purchasing or involved in um, accessing the the trishaws trishaws I got that right. Um, a lot of those organizations can probably apply for grants and be successful to be able to purchase them. It's just knowing that if you're going through government, it takes a quite a while for that to take place. So. Anyway, yeah, so hopefully some of that's useful. The Alberta Business Link, of course, may have some options there for you too. And um, Community Futures in different locations has access to lots of federal programs as well. Debbie, is the uh, link- Thanks, right? thanks Leah, for Is that the right link? That is, you betcha, okay. betcha, thank you. I can't talk and write at the same time, sorry. It's an age thing. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help in the background, but I'm trying, yeah. Yeah, that looks um, amazing. Some, something Debbie just mentioned uh, triggered something in my brain about, um, you know, in the old days, there used to be a thing that came out every year where businesses would be asked to pre-purchase um, a number of tickets for children to attend the circus with at no charge. And so you could find corporate sponsors who... Um, are committed to the same ideals that you're talking about that might be willing to pay for one or two or three or however many, depending on their resources, um, to be donated or given to your recipients. So anyway, I mean, there, I think there's it's a it's definitely a saleable idea and the the positive impacts that you're creating are make it really saleable to lots of people who care about um, you know the impacts that you're creating. So just another random kind of thought floating through. The interesting thing about running a program, and I started the chapter in Beaumont, uh, just outside of Edmonton, is you need some hurdles to, to, to get people motivated to operate the chapter and get through the process of forming the relationships with the care homes and finding the place to store the bike and figuring out how to get it insured so they're vested. So giving the bike away can be amazing in some ways but also will it be used and that's where we're really wanting people to use the bikes and take people out and have those wonderful experiences and share the smiles as we say so and get the wind and those seniors hair so it's uh 
there's some benefit in having to do a bit of work. Has anybody approached, say, the legions or anything like that that deal with, um, you know, a variety of different communities as well as um, senior services, seniors programs and things like that? Um, I, I just throw that out there just because I'm a vice president of one and I was just thinking of that. Might be, <laughs> yeah, sorry, just throwing it in there. Yeah, they're, but, uh, they're definitely on the target. And we do, okay. uh, we do, I just we do have them at two different care homes where um, they okay. are, um, yeah, that, that because, it is. Because we do, we do have some funding yeah. in our, in our legion. Yeah. In yes. the poppy fund, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, to support any kind of programs yeah. that are related to, um, yeah to providing services to seniors and uh, if I can be bad today and just sure. mix things up a bit um, my favorite story is in Canmore where um, I uh, we used to just get the women they would only come out the men were too macho to ride in our bike and then one day finally I got one of the gentlemen in the bike and we got out and he found out that the legion was only three blocks away from the care home <laughs> so so now the uh, you see this little um, it's like an ant trail of the men all got together and realized they could walk down at two o'clock when it opened. They could walk down and have a drink now because it's only three blocks away. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but anyways, we've taken up so much time. We really appreciate all of the input. Thank you for the thoughts. Um, it's given us lots to think about. So I certainly want to let others, you know, have an opportunity to talk as well. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks. And let us know, you know, how things go. It'd be great to, to follow up. Debbie, did you have anything else that you wanted to share about the crowdfunding? You had said in the chat that you, you wanted to, you know, look at any opportunities you do crowdfunding for supports. Uh, a couple things. I thought one of my colleagues or two of my colleagues might be on this call today. Um, but we are, uh, I'm working with, a, a different part of policy people to put together another crowdfunding lab. So we'll be putting that together in for May and June, probably. So if you want to learn how to do, how to actually get your, your project up on the site and all that kind of stuff, we go through a three evening sessions uh, to teach you how to do it. Otherwise you can do it on your own. Um, there's two different links there and you can either donate or set up your own um, organization to, to, to do it yourself. Um, so we're putting that together. The other people that I thought might be on the call were from two other different streams that we have. I'm from the organizational development stream. So I work mostly with uh, nonprofits and charities um, individually, or I do training on fundraising. And uh, I just was in Grand Prairie and DeBolt and uh, County of Parkland here in the last week doing some workshops on a variety of different things around funding and fundraising and all that kind of stuff. So, but we're also kind of getting a cross ministry group together to look at social enterprise development. So I had tagged them and said, Hey, you guys should come to these sessions because you'd learn a lot, but uh, they're not here today. So, um, so hopefully we, we have a meeting tomorrow morning. So I'll um, chat with them and, uh, uh, I, I do think that we're moving sort of in this direction, but I'm not sure what that's going to look like from the government's uh, point of view. So anyway. Great. Tell them April 10th. That's the next one. Um, Absolutely. And so for the crowdfunding opportunity, are there limits or are there, you know, what, what sorts of. No, there's no limits. No, uh, there's lots of information on it. If you go to the website, there's quite a, uh, you know, there's a bit of a write up on what's involved in it and how it all works and all that kind of stuff. So a little more detail. But Excellent. Thank you. It, it's mostly a learning, like a lot of the, the small organizations that have done it or are doing it. Uh, we had, we've had some real successes with it and we've had some real not so successful uh, groups. So we had um, a group up in the North country, Peace country, raised $37,000 over a few months. So they did pretty, pretty well. And others didn't quite make their, what they had uh, aspired to uh, achieve. And then others that said, wow, we didn't think we could pull it off just raising money for the roof of a shed, you know, but uh, to store their adaptive uh, outdoor recreation equipment in. So, but they did, you know, so yeah, so it was kind of cool. So I think it's um, 
it's it's a new thing that we're trying and you know it's like raffle box when everybody wanted to do online fundraising and they didn't understand about 50 50s and you know you got the oilers foundation that's making a lot of money off of the whole 50 50 thing and and then other groups are like well how can we do that too so so it's just you know just letting people know there's other options out there and there's other ways of doing things so Anyway, I, I work a lot rural and I work a lot with the newcomer communities in, in Edmonton, so. Great, thank you. Um, Colette here. At, uh, so I'm the member service coordinator at the Calgary Federation of Communi Calgary Communities. And, um, and I'm mostly here to learn, but in previous roles, uh, a lot in the Yukon, a little bit in Southern Alberta, I had been responsible for initiating a number of social enterprises. So it's a it's an area I'm super interested in. And I've also done lots of other things around program development and that kind of stuff. So it's all in that kind of creative space of, it feels like making magic happen sometimes when you bring something out of thin air. But um, for today, I'm just here to learn about what resources are available and and have a chance to meet and connect with some of the other thought leaders in this sphere. Um, at the Federation, we are bouncing around some ideas about some of the, the different areas that are our strengths and things that make us different in terms of our services and, and thinking about how some of those may or may not turn into social enterprise offerings. So, um, but mostly I'm just here to learn. And so there's just been some fantastic, fantastic dialogue around the table today, and I'm really grateful to sit in. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Trico Foundation does have some training that's all online that you can access anytime you want. Don't even have to register. Ida will put that in the link for you if you want to check out. And then Namada for Alberta is this resource for all resources. So if someone could put that in the... Yeah, uh, I have been on the there. Oh, have yeah. you? Okay, good. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, tons of great, of great um, information. But yes, thank you. Debbie, I think as well, isn't there on uh, your department's site a list of various resources that uh, Creative Partnerships provides? I don't have that link handy, but when I was there, I think you have a page that has some things that seem to good resources. Well, I don't know if all of them are in the matter or not. Um, there's another, yeah, right. So now we have, um, that's a different group, but we have the Nonprofit Learning Center. And you can just Google that and it comes up. We just launched that last fall. So there's webinars, there's YouTube videos, there's all kinds of information on everything about governance, anything related to fundraising, anything related to nonprofit, the nonprofit sector. There's information on grants. You can take the live webinars, you can take the recorded ones, you can look at all the other information that's there. There's print resources. Uh, there's stuff on funding, stuff on grants, all that kind of information is there and it's all free. So, um, yeah, we just we're just uh, trying to get as much stuff out there as we can. And we were kind of hard to find for a while, but we're, we're starting to come to the front. So <laughs> we're uh, we're getting there. Uh, thanks for asking there, Dan. Panelists, is there anything that you would like to share that's going on? uh in in your world or you know that you think could be interesting for for folks here i can jump in uh, uh eleanor chu our co-founder recently gave uh, a speech that we did a, a blog on about social entrepreneurship how it's defined the examples as well as how the chu's personal journey linked to their dedication to business serving community as well as social entrepreneurship so we can put that link in there and we recently did an update blog on one of our favorite Canadian social enterprises, Ember's Staffing Solutions. They won our social enterprise award in 2013 under the under 1 million in revenue category. And they've recently broke, I think 14, 60 million, something like that in revenue. So it's just a really amazing story. So it has put that in there as well. And it just shows you what you can do. Uh, even as a charitable organization where you really figured out how to use a business model serving a social purpose. Yeah, those are great. I'm looking forward to digesting those. Thank you. I'm, I'm lagging a question behind and that you asked about resources and it prompted a thought in my head. So I'll pop one in the chat, which is that 
Um, we have on our website a loan readiness self-assessment tool that we point some organizations who are thinking about applying for our um, loan program towards if they're thinking about going through am I ready or not. Uh, every funder will have different criteria. Every funder will look at this a bit differently, but it's just a good starting point to some of the questions that we do look at. So I'll pop that in the chat in case it's useful to anyone. Great. Thank you. And then I just got an update on, uh, I'd say an under the radar social enterprise that's relatively new that the Calgary John Howard Society started. It's a moving company. And uh, do you know what, Alex? Are you supporting I, 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 I'm the chair at Calgary John oh, Howard yeah, Society. So I, small I world. That, yeah, <laughs> you're on the board. And uh, when I did an intro to Jane last year, so I was just exchanging emails with Leslie and she was telling me how it's going really well. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. So there's the link to the So Just Moving Services. I think it's super cool and i really appreciate how john howard said like leslie and i were talking about it kind of early on i'd say and i really appreciate how Kyrie john howard said like took it slow and like didn't try to go too big too fast and like test the market and make sure they can deliver so that like like any social enterprise if if you provide a poor service product or service and it's low quality you, eventually your business model is gonna likely fail so I really appreciate that they've tried to like make sure that they can actually deliver the service. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's great that it's, they're taking that approach and that's why it's kind of under the radar, but uh, slowly uh, making a difference. So Alex, you can tell uh, Leslie, I gave a plug to so just. Well, I will let her know. Yeah, thanks Jeff. That's great. We have another question from the ski hill. Jane. <laughs> I just want to share a fun story. So last night, um, my husband used to um, teach the entrepreneurial program over at MRU. And so he had a bunch of colleagues over at the house and I was preparing dinner and I pulled out some greens and he looked at it and I'm ashamed to say, I don't remember the name of the company, but he looked at it and he goes, that was one of my students from MRU and they're growing greens here in Alberta in a warehouse and they're taking the um the parts that they're not selling and they're feeding fish and then they're selling fish to different restaurants around Calgary. So I was pretty proud and pretty excited to hear that um you know they've they've figured out a model and they're in all of the centers um across Calgary anyways. So that was my good story coming from Alberta. Ida and Jessica are wondering if it deep water farms. Yes, that was those guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was so excited to know that A, I was supporting them and B, that they're doing so much. So that's awesome. That's wonderful. We just took students there for a tour a little while back. As oh, well. fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where it gets fun is like name that social enterprise. <laughs> that's a game show that we can put on. Yeah. I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> This is quite a nice um, resource heavy uh, chat. So this is definitely a good one to download the chat from for sure. Um, I've just put in the link for the registration for next month. So that'll be April 10th. We look forward to seeing you and Jane, you, I expect you to be somewhere else next time. Um, Maybe you can all call from another, hopefully, outdoor location because it'll still be just as warm as it is right now. It's very lovely out there. Uh, anyone else have anything they would like to add, either in the chat or any final words to say? All right. Well, if that's all, then I guess we can wrap up for the day. And hopefully we'll see you all again next month. Um, thank you very much to all of you for joining us. And thank you so much to um, Brad, Dan, Alex, and Jeff for joining us as panelists today. As always, we really appreciate your thoughts, your feedback, and your guidance. Um, so everyone, please go enjoy the day.